it is. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar, Developing a Program to Reduce Trail Conflicts. My name is Candace Gallagher, and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 199th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails yeah. webinar series. This free webinar, it's being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. And links for the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz will be in the chat box. And attendees will receive um, a follow-up email from me with a link to the recording, the transcript, the resources slide with the presenter email, as well as additional links that they've shared, um, as well as learning credit details within two days. And we are saving time uh, for attendee questions at the end of the webinar, but you are welcome to send your questions at any time during the presentation via the Q&A uh, icon that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. So I would like to thank our webinar partners today uh, that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the USDA Forest Service, as well mm -hmm. as the National Park Service. And I would like to introduce our presenter for today. We have Kirk Kruger, who is the president of Trail Partners Foundation. So I am excited to pass controls over to Kurt to get started. Welcome and thank you, Candace and American Trails for hosting this webinar about reducing conflicts on our public trails. My name is Kurt Kruger. I live in the foothills of the Sierra Mountains and I recently retired from a marketing position involving environmental equipment. I'm also one of the founders of Trail Partners, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. And here's the agenda for today's session. Uh, trail conflict, is it an issue for you? I'll explain what the Trail Partners Foundation is all about, how to develop your own local program, what we've learned about changing behavior, resource protection, and finally, if you already have a program in place, I'll talk about best practices that you can use to evaluate your program. We'll also have time for a Q&A uh, at the end of the session. So please write your questions and comments in the Q&A section and Candace will moderate as many as we have time for. So here are some questions to think about. Uh, do user groups complain about others? Uh, is crowding an issue? What about COVID? It brought more people to the outdoors. Has that been good or bad for you? And lots of answers on that one. So trail partners. Trail partners began over a decade ago in the mountains near San Francisco as a collaboration of three separate groups, MCBC, uh, which is the Marin County Bicycle Coalition, the Marin Horse Council, and the Marin Conservation League. The Marin Conservation League is one of the most active environmental organizations in California. The three groups realized that although they often opposed each other on many issues, they had a common interest in two goals, safety and resource protection. Each of the three groups committed to a long-term effort to find a lasting solution to what had become a serious safety issue. We met weekly for two years before we agreed we were ready to roll out our program. Think about that. That's almost 100 meetings over two years, and that was just the beginning. The result was Trail Partners, a continuing collaboration and the Slow and Say Hello program that has continued to evolve over the past decade. And this year, we created a separate entity, the Trail Partners Foundation, to share our experience and lessons learned across all of North America. Here's a three minute video offering feedback from local trail users. The biggest thing that I've seen is a lot more, a lot more use generally across the disciplines 
and and the, and the advent of bikes out on the trails and fire roads. Uh, my name is John McConnell, and I'm a ranger of the Marine Municipal Water District. Uh, Rich Peterson, and I'm here representing the Taylor Pikes High School. My name is Suzanne Gooch, and I'm uh, out here representing the equestrian community. I'm Katie Rice. I'm a Marine County Supervisor. I represent the Ross Valley, and I'm also a Marin County native, grew up in Mill Valley, and have hiked and ridden horses and bikes and taken my dog all over the trails and fire roads of this great open space for the last half century. Well, I think it's a great campaign to bring awareness to the challenges we have of shared use on the trails. And the Slow to Say Hello campaign is great because it reinforces this idea that you have to be able to slow down enough to be able to say hello to somebody as you pass by. And it's amazing when they when the kids do that, it really diffuses things on the trail. I want to say what a few years ago, our bike community, our hiking community, our equestrian community, members of those communities that really saw the need to raise the bar in terms of how we interact out on the trails and came up with this collaborative idea brought it to the County of Marin and the Marin, County, uh, Marin Parks and Open Space to um, you know, get behind a campaign that's about building courtesy and community out on the trails. I've been a part of Sloan Say Hello as uh, a representative of the Water District uh, as part of the public outreach. It's been fantastic. I think uh, it's been great to see not only the agencies and the user groups working together, but more important than that is it really is helpful to the public. and um helping to see the you know the message get out to the public and i've seen it uh, i've seen it firsthand in a lot of these busy areas where we see a more higher traffic uh, especially phoenix lake lake Lagunitas. but we've seen an improvement with relations between the different user groups on the mountain really stunning how much the hiking and biking community appreciated getting to understand uh, horses and equestrians out on the trails i actually did not know that horses didn't perceive riders the same way that they perceive pedestrians or, or hikers. So it's a real thing to learn. And ever since then, I've gone out of my way to stop and get off my bike whenever I encounter an equestrian and, you know, talk to them, or at least, you know, if, if I'm riding up slowly to them, I, I talk to them first uh, before the horses get skittish and ask the riders if it's okay to ride by. I can feel it out there. And I've been walking these hills and trails for decades. The presentation will focus on how you can develop your own program without having to reinvent the wheel. So how do you communicate with your visitors? Um, social media has changed things somewhat, but the primary method used by most land, land managers is signage. Well, how well does that work? We've found that signage, while helpful, is not enough. In fact, a program that actually changes behavior requires much more than just posting signs. We've identified uh, several steps to create a program that actually works, and I'll talk about each of these. Uh, feel free to take notes. However, most of this material is on the Foundation website, trailpartners.org. The first step is deciding who's going to develop your program. The approach that has worked for us in the San Francisco area was a collaboration of visitor clubs. While that was very effective for us, we found that in many areas, it's difficult to achieve that level of cooperation. So for many of you, the land manager must drive the effort. I'll talk about both approaches. First, if you are fortunate enough to have the various user groups commit to working together, here are a few recommendations. To be successful, we found that all significant user groups must support the program. Uh, that varies depending on the, uh, the area itself, but uh, you know who's on your own area. The land managers must be on board too, as they recognize that conflict runs counter to their mission. So how do you get that commitment of support? I know of three approaches that have worked. There may be others. In the case of our program, <clears throat> it resulted from an accident and the huge public outcry that followed. Another approach 
is to bring visitor groups on board by making access to trails contingent upon active support of the safety program. The best approach, in my opinion, is for national organizations to promote a nationwide safety program. And we're working on that. Leave No Trace is an example of an effective nationwide program. More advice on getting, securing support uh, from the various user groups. Limit the collaboration to a few common interests. You must also expect that you will disagree on other issues and you have to be okay with that. Is that all it takes? No. Um, commitment, long-term perspective. Um, this is a long-term effort, Recognizing, recognize that and commit to it. The Director of Parks and Open Space in our area, Linda Dahl, helped our collaboration get off the ground. One of the most important recommendations was to create a group identity for us. That way people would realize that when we talked about issues as trail partners, we were truly interested in trail safety, not the promotion of our own group's agenda. We also had to be open to other approaches and opinions we hadn't heard before. And finally, to formalize our mutual agreement, we created an MOU or Memorandum of Understanding. The MOU is important for several reasons. For us, it clearly defined our common interest, but just as important, it made clear that we would continue to disagree in other areas. It also helped convince dissenters within our own groups that this was a worthwhile effort. However, back to the agency-driven approach, we've found that for most public lands, it will be up to the agency to take the lead. You can do it, but be sure to take the time to do it right. Start with what issues are you trying to address? What behaviors create these issues? Start by asking yourself and other people probing questions. What are the existing behaviors? And in what way are these behaviors either unsafe or harmful to habitat? What are the desired behaviors? We developed charts that depicted what we were seeing that was a problem and what we would like to see in the future. So keep asking people the question, why? Why do people behave that way? Why is there hostility? And that leads you to a root cause analysis. A root cause analysis was developed by industry to solve manufacturing problems. It's an incredibly useful tool when addressing behavior change. Often people address a behavior they don't like without understanding why people exhibit that behavior. They end up addressing a symptom rather than the root cause of the issue. If you focus on addressing symptoms, you won't solve the underlying behavior issues. Here's an example. Your tire is low on air. So you add air. You've treated the symptom. Does adding air every day fix the problem? Obviously not. You have to fix the leak in the tire. If you try to solve an issue by treating a symptom, you'll never be successful. So how do you drill down to get to the root cause? Try asking why. A trail user is, why, is rude. Why? Because other visitors are yelling at him. Why? Because they're afraid for their little kids with all these fast trail users. Do the speedy trail users scare people on purpose? No. Then why do they do it? Root cause. They don't understand that they are frightening others. Trail conflict has three main causes, more people, speed, and poor sight lines. Let's look at each of these three causes. Speed. Physical accidents between trail users are rare, thank goodness. However, a fast moving user, say a jogger, a loping horse, or a mountain bike rider may feel a trail conflict occurs only when there is an accident when in fact, simply being startled by a fast moving trail user may diminish the experiences that another was seeking, that of calm and solitude, for example. Or it may frighten a parent with little kids or a person with poor balance. This may result in bad will and a lack of trust towards one group, or worse, it may cause an individual to stop visiting an area for safety reasons. In other words, displacement. So our first key finding is user groups 
often don't know the safety needs of other groups. And that was a huge surprise for us. We discovered this a year into our discussions. More people. User density varies dramatically across North America. However, over time, every area will see more people. And the biggest trigger for safety issues is more people. COVID brought more people to the trails. Our trails will only continue to attract more visitors. We have to adapt. It's the new reality. And then not all trails are safe for both fast and slow visitors. Poor sight lines, whether due to terrain or vegetation, can be dangerous. Ignoring this fact contributes to trail conflicts. Land managers must resist the pressure to designate all trails multi-use. Behavior change, that's what we're seeking to do. So that sounds good, but is it possible? To achieve what we're trying to do requires a change in attitudes and a change in behavior. Changing behavior is hard. Those who have struggled with trail issues for years have lots of reasons why this approach will never work. The naysayers whine that people are bombarded with messages encouraging bad behavior. The big companies' ad campaigns focus on speed and adrenaline. They'll never change. And too many people feel entitled. They'll do what they want. So we've asked ourselves, is it possible to change behavior? Our group studied attempts to change behavior and found some oppressive results. A generation ago, Candy Leitner's daughter was killed by a drunk driver. Back then, drinking and driving was tolerated. Penalties were minor. It was socially accepted. Mrs. Leitner set out to change all of that. She was told, you'll never change anything. It's impossible. The alcohol industry is too powerful. She started a movement that changed the way all of us regard drinking and driving. The term designated driver didn't exist at that time. Now all of us know what it means. Every liquor and beer ad today includes the phrase, drink responsibly. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, started by Candy Leitner, changed our culture. This is a slide created by the EPA uh, that describes uh, behaviors. People generally fit into three groups regarding their response to behavior change. Shown here as show me, help me, and make me. The tail on the left consists of those people that always follow the rules. The tail on the right consists of those who don't. Often, that group will only respond to enforcement. We target our message on the largest grouping of people, the help me group, that will respond if they understand the rules and the reasons for them. We do not target the make, re, make me group. We isolate them. This is a sign that was posted in Yosemite National Park. Um, people did not respond well to that sign. Uh, they had posted it because they were nesting birds in the area and people ignored it. So the rangers added two words to the sign and compliance dramatically increased. Why did the second sign work when the first one didn't? People don't respond well to being lectured or told what to do. What works better is to explain the reasons behind the rules. Explain the reason why. Just telling people what to do doesn't work. Let me say that again because it's important. Just telling people what to do doesn't work. The key is education. Explaining the safety or resource protection issues is the path to successful behavior change. Another key is finding that most trail visitors learn best from others in the same group. Horse people lecturing mountain bike riders just doesn't work well in most cases. Another source people listen to is friends. And finally, Rangers typically have the respect of trail visitors and speak with authority. So what should the message be? Our research found that having a preset notion of right away works well on highways, but doesn't work well on trails. There are too many variables on trails, sight lines, tread width, slope, number of users of each type, et cetera. But most important, unlike vehicle drivers, 
trail users can talk with each other. Promoting active two-way communication between trail users is the single most important factor in creating safe encounters on the trail. Here's an example about communication. A jogger comes up behind a hiker. The hiker hears the jogger yell, on your right. Or maybe the hiker is deaf or has two earbuds in and didn't hear anything. But let's assume she heard on your right. Often, the hiker moves to the right. We found about 50% of hikers in our area don't know what on your right means. What's the result? It's a collision. Yelling instructions is not communicating. Communicating means a two-way exchange. It doesn't have to be words. It could be a nod or a wave, but it does have to be two-way. Better to say I'm behind you and I want to pass than wait for the hiker to respond. That creates a safe encounter. So trying to follow a predetermined set of rules or interaction doesn't always work. Trails have varying sight lines, terrain, differences in visitor knowledge, capabilities, et cetera. Better to establish what is safe at that moment, at that place, and at that time. The yield sign doesn't always work, but this message does. For example, these bikes moved off the trail to allow the horse to pass. However, sometimes it's safer to have the horses stop and let the bike ride pass. It depends on terrain, number of riders, and sight lines. The rider should make that call rather than trying to follow preset rules. Because sometimes there are no rules for who should do what. We developed a slogan, put yourself in my shoes. We use it to develop targeted messages for each group. I wanna take just a second to emphasize the importance of resource, the resource component of our program. The amount of land and nature will never grow. It's a fixed resource. We have responsibility to protect our lands and its creatures, not just for us and our children, but for their children and generations to come. <coughs> Always remember we are visitors to the outdoors for a short time, but the wildlife and flora live there. It's their home and we have a moral obligation to preserve and protect all of it. Adopting a theme that speaks to your message and is recognizable helps people retain what they've learned. They develop a common vocabulary. We settled on slow and say hello as our theme, and we encourage others to use it too. Repetition is one of the tools for effective learning. So display your theme everywhere you can, as often as you can. Slow and say hello is trademarked to limit its use to a positive education-based program. We invite all of you attending this webinar to incorporate the Slow and Say Hello logo into your programs. Once again, the graphics are on our website, trailpartners.org. Leave No Trace as a theme was developed almost 50 years ago, but had little traction. Then a few years ago, Subaru sponsored a nationwide blitz of workshops and presentations to explain Leave No Trace and its important to our public lands. Today, the phrase is repeated all over the place so people get an ongoing reminder. That's our goal with Slow and Say Hello. Education methods. Beyond these two main goals of safety and resource protection, uh, we represented different cultures, different recreational experiences. We needed to shift from focusing on our differences to understanding what we share as we recreate how to accommodate differences, make them work together. Most important, how could we educate others and change behaviors to reflect this recognition? These are the approaches we adopted. However, every area is unique. What works for some doesn't work everywhere. For us, outposts at trailhead or congested intersections is an effective, an effective way to engage visitors. 
Our table has a variety of branded swag, including stickers, socks, Chico bags, etc. At every outpost, we try to have a mountain bike person, an equestrian, a hiker, environmentalist, and a ranger. This allows us to have visitors talk with someone from their own user group. We created a trifold brochure. It has sections written by different user groups for that group. It also has a section that focuses on protecting the resource. The generic version is available for download on our website, trailpartners.org. You can use it as, as is or add your logos or organization name before printing. When we started having outposts, we had problems engaging visitors to hear our message. We came up with a trail quiz. Uh, before that, we'd ask people to stop and listen to our safe story about safety. And the typical answer was, oh, I know about safety and I have to meet my friends. Now we say, how'd you like to take a short trail quiz? Get two answers right and you win a prize from our table. Now 90% of the people stop and the discussion begins. Some of the questions are designed to challenge and show people that they don't know as much as they thought they did. For example, you approach a horse and rider while jogging or riding a bike on a trail. On which side should you pass? Or you encounter a puddle completely across the trail. Do you go around it or through it? Think about the answers to those because I'll, I'll give you our answers in just a minute. At that point, most people become engaged and spend 10 to 20 minutes learning more about safety and the resources around them. Most horses don't care but some do, I'm sorry. At that point, most people become engaged and spend 10 to 20 minutes learning more about safety and the resources around them. So question number one, our suggested answer is you ask the rider how to pass safely. Most horses don't care, but some do. Question number two, going around the puddle will make the trail larger at that point. Better to go through the puddles. Websites, Facebook, Instagram, and who knows what we'll see tomorrow. An effective program utilizes all tools available to you. Be creative. An example appeared at a, a nearby California State Park, the Auburn State Recreation Area. Uh, one of the rangers, Joseph Shanahan, created a video there completely on his own. I'll show the video to you right now. It's a short one. What brings you in today? I'm suffering from a, a sense of anxiety. Sorry to hear that. Uh, I'm going to do a simple test. It's, it's called an inkblot test. And just tell me the first thing that pops into your head when you see the image, okay? Okay. All right. That's a cougar! That's a female cougar! That's a cougar riding a bicycle! That's totally normal for a horse to feel that way about these other trail users. And I've got a simple solution for you. Take this out on the trail with you. Spread the word, tell your friends. Slow and say hello. I can do that. I can do that. So kudos to Joseph for being creative and helping to spread the safety message. Another component of the Slow and Say Hello program is Tails and Tires. It was developed for high school mountain bike racing teams. It has since become popular with a variety of trail users. We start with a 30 minute talk about horse physiology, including prey and predator concepts and what makes a horse spook. We also ask them why we have public trails instead of more houses and pavement. Many of them had never even thought about that. Then, and this is the most popular part, we have the kids get in the saddle and we lead them around. For many, it's a real eye-opening experience. The third part involves demonstrating safe passing techniques, both when approaching an oncoming horse and rider and when overtaking a horse from behind. 
We've conducted tails and tires in several Northern California counties. Almost anyone can conduct these sessions. We have training materials complete with scripts for the instructors. Again, these are available to anyone on our website. Let's hear what the kids themselves have to say about it. Another short video. The purpose of Tails and Tires is to primarily to teach mountain bikers. And right now we're focused on the mountain bike racing teams to teach them how to safely interact with horses on the trails. Horses don't recognize mountain bikes as a person on a bicycle. They see it as something unknown and they run from it. So we're teaching safe ways to interact with oh, the riders. Hey, I want to ride by the woods. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Have a good day. We were trained of how to go on to a horse. And the big thing was talking to them, talking to the rider and just talking in general, because that helps soothe the horse. And that helps get the whole situation calmed down. We did uh, some fun exercises. We rode on horses and it was amazing. It was really fun. But it was scary, too. I thought all the people here riding the mountain bikes were very open to learning about, like, how to manage stuff with horses and how to deal with them on trails. So I thought that was very good. And I feel like if um, this can expand to the, like, whole county, then definitely a lot of more mountain bikers will know how to act around a horse. So I won't be that nervous anymore going on a trail or encountering a mountain biker. I think this type of event, this Tails and Tires event, um, where horses and bikes can work together to create a enjoyable trail experience um, is really useful. People should definitely take advantage of it. Well, Tails and Tires, I think, is both a educational opportunity, but it's a very fun way uh, not only to learn uh, how to respond out on the trails and interact with your fellow trail user, um, but you're also uh, getting to know your, your fellow trail users. <laughs> It's important to reach out to others for feedback. If you've worked on a project for a while, you're often too close to it to see it as others will. Among the first people we demonstrated our program to was the marketing team at REI. With big proud smiles on our faces, we asked them what they thought. Their answer, go back to the drawing board. Here's what you did wrong. <laughs> We walked out mumbling to ourselves. But one plus in asking for feedback from a club or even a politician is that if you adopt a suggestion from them, they are then invested in your project and will help promote it. <laughs> Trail conflicts and resource protection are ongoing issues. You've got to plan and budget for a multi-year program. Education takes place one person at a time. Social media might reach more people in a shorter time frame, but you should plan for the long term. And finally, <clears throat> learn, adapt, and improve. Continuous improvement must be a part of your approach. Every program must evolve. Initially, you should assume you'll discover better ways to improve your message or get more people to hear it. Regardless, Changes in technology, the makeup of your visitors, and cultural shifts require you to adapt your program. <clears throat> Our website includes a page with a list of best practices. If you already have a program in place, compare it to these best practices. Initially, this is a list of what we've found works and what doesn't. We encourage others to submit best practices from their own experiences. Your suggestions will be reviewed by the Foundation Board for inclusion on this webpage. My advice to any of you that may be considering a trail conflict program, take the time to do it right. Establish trust among diverse users. Develop a message that resonates. It took us two years of meetings among ourselves, along with presentations of our concepts to others, to refine our message. And then once we launched our program, we continued to learn and improve. Over a decade ago, a collaboration of mountain bike, hiker, environmentalists, and equestrians 
developed a program <clears throat> that's made a significant difference for safety and resource protection in Marin County. The Trail Partners Foundation exists today to help others across North America achieve a similar success. We've learned much over the past decade, and we want to share that knowledge and experience. Thank you. And now in the time we have left, Candace, do we have any questions or comments? We sure do. Thank you so much, Kurt. Really appreciate your time and in, in um, explaining uh, the slow and say hello program and what you guys have done on your end. Um, we definitely have some questions that have come in. Um, the first one comes from Esme, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, do you have any advice uh, for specifically working with permitted hunters and hikers to reduce conflict, you know, boost safety for both groups? I think uh, I don't have specific recommendations, but the same principles apply. <clears throat> you have to understand what the issues are. Um, I have uh, hunted and I've also hiked. Um, it's important, I know that hikers understand um, that in a hunting area, um, there are ways you can protect yourself and, and places you shouldn't be. But uh, beyond that, uh, I think you need to uh, talk with hunters and understand what the issues are and, and get down to what, uh, what kind of concerns you have. Um, Miles is asking, do you think campaigns like Trails or Common Ground are effective, or do we all need local coalitions to deal with conflict on multi-use trails? From my experience, something like Trails or Common Grounds is kind of an umbrella that lays out a set of principles um, for all trail users. Um, but it uh, also, from my experience, it doesn't speak to how you would change individual behavior on trails. It doesn't get to the root causes of the issues. Um, the education component uh, has to vary based on the local users. Um, last uh, summer, um, I was up in Canada and we did a couple of slow and say hello presentations. <clears throat> and um, one caller from Northern uh, Alberta mentioned that his largest conflict was between um, cross country skiers and snow machine guys. And <clears throat> I had no experience whatsoever in that kind of situation. So uh, again, you go to the, the basic concepts and principles, uh, discover what the root causes are and uh, through education address uh, the needs of the various users. All right, thank you. Uh, Randy is saying that the growth in sales of electric motorized bicycles, you know, and specifically e-mountain bikes brings additional concerns over trail conflict as a result of potential faster speeds and perhaps relatively unexperienced riders on motorized bikes. What has uh, your coalition done to address e-bike use and its potential for conflict? So the position of the Trail Partners Group is that uh, E-bikes are no different from any other fast user on the trail. We do recognize that uh, E-bikes tend to bring people on the trails that have less experience than others. So education is has a greater need. We have talked among ourselves about how we might deal with some of the E-bike vendors to provide some education, maybe some pamphlets or something or video at the shops. Um, but it's it's a new kind of learning experience for all of us. Uh, Teria's uh, mentioned that their local mountain bike club has a Bells for Bikes program where bells are distributed at trailheads and kiosks and are sponsored and, and donated by stores and businesses. Um, she had mentioned this at a, San, at a San Francisco Bay Area trails group, and they had never heard of this. Are the, Do you have any comments on Bells for Bikes? We think Bells or Bikes are a a very good initiative uh, if there's some explanation that goes along with it. Um, horses, for example, don't know what a bell is. Uh, however, the rider of the horse should know what it is. And um, I personally was involved in an accident where a, a person on a bike came around a blind corner and the horses spooked and people were, they had some minor injuries, but 
The person on the bike said she had a bell on her bike, but she thought it would scare the animals, so she wasn't ringing it. So you have to understand what its purpose is. The Marin County Bicycle Coalition uh, distributes bells at most of their events, along with an explanation of what they do and how to use them. Um, they're perfectly uh, suited to warn other users when approaching a blind corner or coming over the crest of a hill or something of that sort. Uh, it's not um, a license to uh, obey, disobey other safety rules. It's simply a tool to help alert other people on the trail um, that you are coming. Okay. Um, Randy has a good, oh, go ahead. One of the things, the giveaways on our uh, outpost tables are bicycle bells, and we'll install them on the spot if someone asks. Um, Randy had a follow-up question and wondering if you, well, I, I guess in regards to the R REI, um, when you talk to REI, any idea why the REI folks suggested that you start over again? Uh, it wasn't that we start over again. Our initial uh, theme was um, say hi. And they said that sounded too trite. Um, we also uh, didn't have uh, in our brochure, something that spoke to each of the individual users. So um, they they were looking at it with different eyes. And we had worked together for a couple of years developing all of this, and we needed some uh, a secondary opinion, a secondary view. That's all. So it wasn't starting over. It was tweaking what we had um, to make it more effective to someone who hadn't seen any of it before. Um, Michael's asking, how about some advice or modifications to your program for a completely urban context? Their issues are road bikes versus walkers, and especially seniors and parents with small children. Uh, I think the biggest issue um, goes to the slide that talks about the startle factor. Um, many people don't understand that a slow moving person, and that's a parent with kids, but it can also be a disabled person or elderly, um, that they get scared when somebody comes whizzing by them. Um, whether it's a bike or a, a, a jogger, uh, I'll just call it a fast user goes by them quickly. They don't understand the effect that that has on the slower person. Um, so again, it's education. <clears throat> we were asked to um, use some of our program components on a, a path next to um, in elementary school, um, people would, and this was in a suburban area, would ride bikes or walk along this path to get to school. And the same issues that you're describing occurred there. The, the fast moving users would zip by and would frighten the slower ones. Uh, Jane is wondering if you have advice for busy public land with lots of multi-use trails that receive a lot of out-of-town visitors. So not the local population being as much as the problem. Um, people are finding out about the public land cycling reputation and come there with the mentality it is a bike park. Um, <clears throat> the area where our program started is probably the has a, is a really good recreation area for several counties in the vicinity. Point Reyes, for example, National Seashore gets visitors from all over uh, California and the West. Um, and we are constantly seeing people who haven't seen our program before. Um, it is my hope over the long term uh, that the Slow and Say Hello will become enough of a program, just like Leave No Trace, that people will learn about it from other areas and get the reinforcement of its message just by seeing the verbiage um, somewhere. But continuing education, it, it never ends. It, it has to be an ongoing program. Okay. Haley asks a good question, and it seems like some trails, um, primarily for hikers, meaning no bikes or equestrian allowed you know, use, can still be grounds for trail conflict. Can you share any piece of advice for interpersonal conflicts between hikers on trails? You know, In your experience, can trail uh, code of conduct be helpful? You know, from our experience, hikers almost universally say hi and nod or whatever to each other. Um, so, um, 
beyond beyond that, I can't. Um, one of the effects of having our outposts is that people seem to have a higher opinion of other people out on the trail. Um, before we began our program, there was hostility and suspicion, and uh, having friendly people providing education seems to diffuse that. So um, beyond beyond that, I, I don't have any suggestions. Okay. Uh, Scott says, how do you suggest safely, or asks, how do you suggest safely passing someone wearing earbuds when approaching from behind? Well, difficult question. First of all, our message to people who uh, have earbuds is to wear just one of them when they're out on the trail. Uh, but the second thing is um, you have to recognize that that person does not know you're there, does not hear you, and may be startled. And uh, you, you have to use your judgment as the best way to handle that. It depends on is there a wide spot on the terrain? Uh, can you yell? If, will they hear you if you yell? I uh, Not an easy answer. Um, Lee says that many public agencies have limited resources. How have the public agencies that you've worked with funded engagement and outreach, including outreach materials? So uh, initially, our, our groups, there are three groups, uh, began our process. And uh, when we started to have a need for funds, uh, we reached out to some local uh, nonprofits, most uh, Parks, um, most uh, areas, the national parks included, have 501c3 kind of uh, organizations to help support them. And we received, I think it was four donations of $500 each from uh, these various organizations to begin printing our brochures and so forth. Um, as we continued the program, uh, we did presentations to the county supervisors who fund state or county parks. Um, we also approached uh, state parks. Danita Rodriguez was the superintendent at the time. Um, we also had uh, enthusiastic support from the water district, which is a huge land manager because they have the watershed reservoirs. Um, and initially we got uh, a year into it, something like that, $1,000 from each of these groups. Uh, and they have since upped the participation. So the the pop-up tents, the tables with the tablecloths and the swag um, are basically funded now by the land managers to the tune of uh, $1,500, $2,000 each. Uh, and that's all it takes. It's not a lot of money. Um, uh, and that's how it's done. We also have gotten some support from Cliff Bar and from REI, uh, more in terms of, of product and materials uh, than cash. But um, there are Rotary Clubs, there are other entities out there. Uh, I talked with a person yesterday who is uh, in the Reno area, Carson Valley, uh, and they are pursuing a grant from the state parks for an education program. So um, again, it, it's different in every area. Uh, it's not a lot of money for most places, but you know nobody has extra money kicking around. So it's something you have to work on. Um, Galley is asking, what metrics do you use to measure success? This is a, a, a question that we have dealt with uh, without coming up with a good answer for some time. Um, the first video that I showed uh, provides lots of anecdotal information. We don't have any hard metrics, and there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, uh, it's not uncommon for land managers or others to do surveys at trailheads. And uh, the biggest issue with those is that people who have been displaced don't get surveyed. So the only scientifically sound way to do a, a survey would be to take a, a neighborhood, for example, and survey every household in that neighborhood. Um, we did get one bit of sort of uh, data-based information. Uh, the land manager who handled the reservoirs and the watershed for the water district uh, asked us to set up uh, an outpost and 
we put up sandwich boards called safety zones. They have a ring road around this small reservoir. You know, it's a mile or two long. Uh, and at the trailhead around the reservoir, we, we set up the outpost and we, you know, did our trail quiz and we asked questions and engaged with a lot of people. Uh, and that, that land manager, Mike Swayze was his name, said that he used to get complaints routinely about problems on that particular loop trail. And in the season following our outposts, we did several of them, the complaints dropped to zero. Now, we don't have this written down in any kind of scientifically uh, robust manner, but um, yeah, the metrics are a tough one. Uh, Esme is asking, how do you measure the rate of hostility or conflicts on the trails? Is it surveyed? Is it tracked on trail cams? Uh, it's by personal interviews. Um, the, uh, what, what I define as hostility is when people from the different user groups no longer want to have any kind of conversation or talk with people from other user groups. Um, uh, it's not uncommon when someone has had a bad experience to start yelling at others who may have had nothing to do with their bad experience, but they're, you know, they were scared by a jogger, so they start yelling at other joggers and or, or mountain bikes or whatever. It just goes downhill from there. Another is is dog walkers. You know, I have a dog. I take my dog on trails, um, and if people have a bad experience, they tend to associate others. Uh, with that same bad behavior, and that's not uh, <laughs> not uh, productive at all. Okay. Um, Jeff uh, mentioned, you know, for trail planners, what is an appropriate response to a project review comments that call out trail conflicts as a reason not to develop a trail? Um, the issue of trail conflicts. <clears throat> um, I think you have to address it as if the people were well educated, uh, if their behavior was such that they understood the issues, would there still be problems? And when I say that, if you have limited sight lines, whether because of trail width, vegetation, curves, uh, hill rises, um, that uh, those kinds of conditions speak to not having a trail be multi-use. Um, if you had, as an example, a trail on the, and I'll make an extreme example, a trail on the side of the Grand Canyon that was one person wide, um, you wouldn't want to have, um, and on the downhill side, you it was a thousand foot cliff. You wouldn't want to have people coming in opposite directions of different types of users on that trail. That one's obvious, but, um, same sort of thing. You have to evaluate the sight lines and the width, the trail widths and so, tread widths and so forth. Now, uh, it's different in every area. Uh, San Diego, for example, <clears throat> may have trails that have narrow tread widths, but the vegetation is such that it usually doesn't get any higher than three feet in most in many areas. So people can see each other coming a long way away. So that doesn't create the same issue as uh, a dense forested area. So uh, it's a judgment call, but uh, the issue is that some areas for political reasons simply decide or declare that everything will be multi-use or not. Uh, a few years back, and it may have changed, uh, LA County <clears throat> had separate trail designations for fast users and slow, but LA City required that everything be multi-use. And I think these kinds of across the board uh, requirements um, are um, are flawed. You have to look at the specifics of the of the situ of the the trail terrain. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Loke. Loke or Loki, I'm not sure, um, is asking, how do you approach changing behavior that has developed over multiple generations? That's an interesting question. The issue of fast versus slow trail users has really only been uh, around 
for a generation, maybe a generation and a half. It's education. Education is the key. Uh, and um, if you, uh, our trail quiz, um, and we adapt a trail quiz based on where we're going to be and the conditions. For example, if we do a uh, an outpost in the Sierra Mountains, we have questions about hunting and the dangers from deer and things of that sort to uh, uh, to animals. But uh, in the mountain near San Francisco, we don't have hunters, so it's a different set of questions. Um, I think education is the key to it all, but you, the questions are structured in a way to educate people. So that's all I can suggest. Our website has um, lists of trail quiz questions, so you can use that as a model. I'd be curious as to what specific behaviors exist that have been around for generations. Um, Lori's asking if the tail and tire program also helps the horse groups with understanding and exposing horses to mountain bikes. It absolutely does. Um, when we are going to put on a tails and tires program, um, we uh, approach the area equestrians and tell them two things. Um, one, if you want your horse to be conditioned by exposure to mountain bikes in a safe environment, this is a perfect opportunity. The second thing, um, for example, um, when a person on a horse sees a mountain bike or approaching them from the front, um, we instruct the rider on the horse to uh, start talking to the mountain biker to get them to engage back. Say, hi, say hello to my horse, his name is Charlie or, or whatever. Um, also, if a person is on a horse and a fast user is coming up behind the horse, again, the horse is a prey animal, it's afraid of being attacked. We ask the rider if it's safe, turn your horse around to face the approaching uh, fast user. So there's, there's other kinds of things. Um, little humorous story, there was a woman who always carried some carrots, and when she encountered a mountain biker, she give a piece of carrot to the mountain biker and ask him to feed her horse. And that worked fine. Uh, but after a year or two, whenever the person on the, whenever the horse saw a mountain biker off in the distance, he'd ignore the rider and run toward the mountain biker because that's where he got carrots. So um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, yes, the horse people have as much to learn as the fast users do. Uh, Esme is asking, how do you identify key people to invite to a program like this from the hiker group if the hikers are not part of a larger hiking club? We faced that very problem. Uh, and our answer was we went to the largest environmental group in the county. And the environmental group consisted primarily of hikers. But our experience is that most hikers do not form large clubs. They may have informal kinds of things. So. Um, look for influential people wherever you can find them. Uh, ask some of the politicians who comes and speaks at meetings, who, who are most vocal. Um, I don't think there's any one answer to identify them, but they're out there. Great. All right, let's have time for one more question. Um... Uh, Mike's asking, how do we get land managers to help focus on the portion of the mountain bike users that fall into the category of requiring enforcement <laughs> to comply with the safety rules on trails? Um, our group has meetings with the land managers, uh, at least annually. And at those meetings, we talk about where we plan to have outposts and ask them if they have events that would be suitable for us having an outpost. Um, so we have developed a partnership. And at that meeting, we remind them that our focus is on the um, show me, help me groups, uh, but that we do not engage in enforcement at all. And uh, a small amount of enforcement on their part uh, goes a long way toward having uh, the, uh, the make me group, um, the uh, uh, that group comply with rules. Uh, it's a tough question, and I, I don't have an answer. Every every area is going to be different. Um, having a uniform ranger at our outposts helps. Um, 
but uh, it's a safety issue. The land manager should recognize the safety component of all of this. Well, thank you again, Kurt, for your time on this topic. Um, we do have um, a few more questions that we were not able to answer. Um, however, I do encourage you um, to contact Kurt yourself if you would um, want to follow up with him. Um, I did share his email, or no, I shared it during the live Q&A on my slide, but this his email will also be included in my follow-up email to all attendees within two days um, following the webinar. And this slide also includes the links to the videos. And I will also include a link to the the, um, uh, his PowerPoint presentation and notes, as I had mentioned, I will add that here before I share that with everyone. So again, um, thank you to Kurt. I, I want to also thank our additional webinar partners that include the National Park Service, the USDA Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, as well as the Federal Highway Administration. And we hope you will be able to join us for our next webinar um, taking place in our Advancing Trails webinar series. Um, and it Next week is our 200th webinar, so we're going to have some fun giveaways, and we are accepting donations um, for our giveaway uh, gift baskets, and we also encourage you to attend as well. So um, thank you again to everyone. We appreciate your time um, in this important topic, and enjoy the rest of your day, and happy trails. <laughs>